Welcome to CoozaCast, where we interview some of the most influential people in tourism from around the world. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of CoozaCast. Today, my guest is Shafiwa Shivengwa, who is the CEO of the TBCSA, that is the Tourism Business Council of South Africa. How are you doing today, Chief? Thank you, and it's great to be with you. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, obviously, we've we've met a few times when I was on the board of SATSA and a couple of weeks ago, I interviewed David Frost, and I've wanted to to get you on board just to get your opinion of how things are going uh, post pandemic. Um, but the way we we generally start is just uh, hear a little bit more about yourself and how you got to got to be in the role that you are now in. So yeah, looking forward to to hearing a bit about uh, about your background. So thanks very much, Chief. Well, and no, I thank you for for having me once again. Um, I've always been uh, in the tourism industry for quite a number of years uh, now. Uh, in fact, um, I did study tourism uh, at Vets uh, uh, Tech, uh, now University of Johannesburg, uh, or what they call STH, uh, School of Tourism and Hospitality. Before it was, it was combined uh, to become one. So back then. You know, at uh, Technicon, you know, uh, Vet Rand, it was, uh, you know, tourism was separate, yeah, hotel school was separate, and then it was combined when it joined in with Rand Africans University to form, and Vista University to form University of Johannesburg. So I've, I've studied tourism. Mm. Uh, uh, so by virtue of studying tourism, you know, in the, in the late, well, I think 1999 or 2000, I started working. Um, oh. I've worked in um, yeah, retail, you know, travel agency space. That's where I started, uh, you know, booking tickets. And, <laughs> uh, yeah, ground you know, up. Yeah. W- working out Galileo, printing tickets. You oh, know, my before, word. All this whole thing was, was automated. So yeah. you know, when I joined, it was at that time when technology was coming in. Um, and, 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 and from there, um, uh, you know, I did went on, um, and I worked in Los Angeles for a travel marketing company, a company called Myriad Travel Marketing then, uh, in, in, in Los Angeles for almost two years. Um, and, you know, I learned a lot there about, you know, tourism marketing, uh, you know, just you know, moving away from the theory, you know, from the classroom, you know, when we were learning to, you know, the practical. Mm. Uh, practical side of things uh, and uh, you know I worked on South African tourism account uh, when I was there as an assistant account executive um, and then that was an internship um, and after I finished I was fortunate enough that the MD of the company um, Al Meshin uh, said to me look you can go when you go home go via New York spend a week there I'll cover your accommodation while I was at New York, I, I went to the African Tourism Office and I said, you know, I was going to see the guys that I've been working with. And then they said, well, you know, there's, you know, in a position uh, yeah. for information officer. I said, oh, well, I went back to the hotel. I said, let me go back and put on my suit and I'll come back <laughs> to interview. <you." laughs> and they interviewed me. But after the interview, I came back to South Africa. After I came back to South Africa, they came back to me and said, well, you got the job. So oh, you wow. need to come back to New York. Mm. Then I had to move back to New York, and then I spent about four years in New York. Uh, and then I decided then that I want to come back home. Um, you know, after four years, then I resigned and I came back home. I worked for companies like Pro Tours, uh, you know, providing transport, ground transport for tourists. Um, I worked for South African, you know, revenue services, SARS. I was uh, heading up travel events and uh, a bit of marketing. Um, after that, I worked for uh, Rennes Travel, one of the largest travel agencies under the Bidvest Group, was the director for business development. Uh, then I moved on from that, uh, became the CEO of Fed Hassa, which is the, the hospitality association, accommodation. Uh, and then from there, I, I came to the TBCSA. Wow. So that has been my journey. Uh, so I did study tourism. I did study a degree in marketing, uh, marketing communications while I was working. And I did my master's in international business uh, and leadership. Uh, so, yeah. 
So that's that's the background, uh, you know, at a high level. Yeah. That kind of point of view. Oh, great! What a what an illustrious uh, what an illustrious career. You and I have something in common. We both worked in Los Angeles, um, very similar areas. We we stayed in. You stayed in Playa del Rey. I stayed in Marina del Rey. Um, yeah, what a beautiful part of the world that that is. Um, remind remind me a lot of of KZN actually. Uh, you know, down in Orange Absolutely. County. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, great, uh, great memories. And um, yeah, I used to work for Cox and Kings and Cita World Tours. So yeah, I think, you know, when, when you work in the country and like I'm sure the experience you got from New York as well, it certainly teaches you how the perceptions of of South Africa are, are from that source market. So um, mm-hmm. yeah, I think it, it, it certainly stood us uh, both in, in, in good stead. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, and, and as you and as your position now, it's uh, it's a it's a great great way to, to look back, and, and you've you've worked in such a d- diverse range of um, of uh, you know of jobs within within the industry. So I mean, from from ninety nine to two thousand twenty four, that's twenty five years. What I mean, how what have you seen change in 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 the tourism industry, particularly for for inbound tourists? I mean, how have you have we adapted to i mean obviously there's there's lots of new activities lots of smmes coming on board but what's can you identify one major thing that you've seen kind of changed in 25 yeah. years well what what i've seen um the number one technology the the, the role yes. of technology um you know and the adoption of new technologies because if you look at 1999 internet itself uh, or being able to access, you know, travel products online, it it was limited, mm. uh, and the channels that were being used then, um, you know, were mainly, you know, the ones that we studied at school, whether it's a wholesale, you know, travel, you know, uh, agency, or the retail space. Uh, online was just starting up, you know, at that time. Mm. So I have seen a change in in how we deliver service in 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 the tourism space, from retail space to wholesale to hotels, car rentals, and the list goes on and on. But in the main, uh, if you look at how you know, uh, I remember when we used to print tickets and we deliver them <laughs> in the office. Yeah. Um, I remember when we used to get credit cards, uh, and we had to validate them with a validation machine. Uh, you know, before we, we we could issue the tickets, and everyone had to go with the tickets at, at the airport. They have to take a stab, and then you know another one when you return. So, to now when everything is done online and mm. the introduction of mobile technology uh, and how you know the consumption of travel has changed uh, in terms of the channel since from then to now. So that has been one of the biggest changes that I've seen. Uh, from the SMME point of view uh, and inbound, you know, seeing a lot of, you know, small business entering the market, uh, seeing, you know, uh, you know, the rise of, you know, shuttle companies, the rise of small DMCs, um, a lot more people getting into tour guiding, uh, even driving of the vehicles and understanding that, you know, driving tourists is different to driving, you know, uh, passengers who are taking public transportation from yeah. point A to point B. Uh, so I, I have seen a lot of changes from that. Lots of SMMEs that have came in, changed the way we do business. But from the inbound point of view, I remember when when I was working in in, in LA, one of the challenges in the North American market that we had was that, uh, you know, the packaging of of South Africa, you know, uh, was done different to 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 what is done now. It was mostly high end, uh, and you know, very few select. Who could afford to travel to South Africa? We had to break down, uh, you know, that that price points. And I remember when we introduced, uh, you know, you, the fact that you can travel to South Africa and pay one thousand nine hundred and ninety nine US dollars. Mm. Uh, you know, it was new, and we sort of started to, to open up that market to say, you know, yes, you can still travel for five thousand dollars, but you can also travel for one thousand nine hundred and ninety nine. Mm. And we started to see an increase in number of people, you know, being interested in South Africa. Uh, we started to see the likes of South African Airways then, you know, uh, flying into New York uh, and Washington, D.C., carrying a whole lot more passengers coming to South Africa. So so in the introduction of that mid-market uh, was quite important, and it showed that South Africa is affordable. And at that time, it was critical that we do that because 
there were few Americans who had passports uh, mm, yeah. to show that uh, you know you can you need to go get your passport and you can be able to travel to South Africa or to Africa and it's affordable and it's not that destination that you say you know maybe one day I will go but for now I can't afford it. So the introduction of that and the changes, you know, around that, I think that was that was a big change for the North American market that 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 I saw. But uh, once again, if if you look during that time, we used to do everything manually. I remember mm. we used to print brochures. We used to yeah. print the South African travel planner, where you know there were lots of people advertised, uh, and those things have changed. If you look now, uh, you know that's also about the technology and the revolution that it brought into our industry so it's it's a whole new world and who it knows is. how what what is going to look like into the future yes well you know I'm, I'm really pleased that the human element is still there i think a lot of travel agencies a lot of businesses you know were extremely worried because everybody thinks they can do it themselves however you know when people are spending five thousand pounds or five thousand dollars you know or even more you know, some some camps charge that per night. <laughs> they um they they do um want to know that you know that they, they somebody who's been there and they've experienced. So I'm so glad to see you know even in the UK there are still loads of travel agencies around, lots of high street retail stores. So you know long long may that um continue. So the TPCSA's role in March 2020. Just describe how when everything started to shut down and uh, you know i i we were on loads of forums and webinars and you, you were getting interviewed on the news quite a lot and everything like that how in terms of the sort of bridge between the industry and government just describe your role and the tbca's role in that in march april may and uh, you know and the rest of 2020 yeah. So I, I I still remember this very well. Um when we started to hear about COVID nineteen. That was in uh, December, wasn't it? Twenty nineteen. Was yeah. Sometime in December in twenty nineteen, and we started to hear that uh, you know, there is uh, you know, a virus that's making rounds, uh, you know, in, in, in China, in Wuhan region. Uh, and I remember that during that time, uh, in that December, I think I traveled to KZN all the way to Mozambique and across the Vampumalang, I came back to, to, to Jobek. And, you know, January, February, you know, everyone was really, you know, downplaying the, you know, the potential impact of this. Um, and I remember some time in the beginning of, in beginning of March or late February, uh, you know, the Minister of Tourism, you know, called us and said, no, we need to have an agent meeting. Mm. And, uh, you know, we, we invited our members, uh, you know, we, from airlines to inbound to everybody else. And we're sitting in a room in, uh, in, in, in Santon in a hotel. And uh, we started talking about, you know, the fact that, uh, uh, you know, this COVID is real. Yes. And the fact that no one knew anything about it, even from government side, it was something new that was coming towards us. And, and I remember sitting in that room and we're all like, okay, then what do we do? Uh, because we're starting to see that in other places, you know, there's total shutdown and so forth and so on. Mm. And, you know, the first case, you know, had been reported in South Africa. Um, and, uh, you know, we needed to, to, to act. And uh, we, were, we then are supposed to sort of shut down. But in the beginning, the, the shutdown was going to be for two weeks. Yes, I remember, yeah. <laughs> it was something that, okay, we're going to shut down for two weeks. Let's see how this thing is going to come. And it's going to go away. And then we'll go back to normal. So we were all amicable to that. The fact that, you know, it's two weeks. You know, let's buckle down. Uh, and then we'll all come back. And then we should be fine. Mm. Uh, and, you know, come, I think, towards the end of, of, uh, of March, uh, the president announced that we're going to have a shutdown, you know, two weeks. We're all were comfortable with that. It's so, okay, it's just two weeks, you know, we don't need to make noise. And that two weeks became, you know, a year. Well, it became another month, another month, two, three, four regulations and so forth and so on. So while we're at that, uh, you know, we were all hopeful that, you know, things are going to open up and we're going to open up quite soon. 
And the reality started to hit um, when we started to look at other countries and the fact that they had been shutting down across the world and nobody knew when they're going to be reopening and no one understood the virus. There was a whole mutations that were going on. So we needed to, to, to get experts, you know, to really talk to us about exactly what is this virus and, you know, how, how severe it is. Can we operate with it? And what is it that we need to do to make sure that we reopen? They, they, we, we got lots of people who were coming from, um, um, you know, the, the, the Institute of Communicable Disease, I think Dr. Bloomberg, uh, you know, coming on board and others, uh, you know, and starting to really talk to us about, uh, you know, what COVID-19 is. And when we started to understand, we started to say, okay, well, what can we do as a tourism industry uh, to make sure that we can reopen and we can operate within the framework of, uh, you know, of this, of this covid that's when we started developing what we call the, the tourism protocols mm. in terms of operating safely and being able to reopen. Um, we developed those protocols. It was an industry effort. Everybody chipped in, yeah. all the experts and people that were working in various subsectors to pull together the protocols and to make sure that we can be able to present those to government to say, open us uh, so that we can operate, but we'll operate within this, frame, with this, this framework or these guidelines. Um, and, and that was great. Everyone came on board and then, you know, we're able to start to have this real negotiation. I must say that, you know, the, the industry leaders, you know, uh, that came on board and these are the, the, the people that invest in our industry, that owns hotels, mm. that owns companies that have invested heavily, uh, you know, in tourism, you know, they came on board. I remember attending many meetings. Uh, you know, with various people who are influential uh, within the tourism space, who are also connected, who knows uh, those that are in high power. And we discussed how we can reopen. And we had, we held a meeting with the president and we presented our point of view to say, you know, we need to reopen and these are the guidelines and framework of reopening. And that's when we were allowed to, to, to open, you know, domestic travel, although it, some of the provinces were still closing because they were looked at as a, uh, a, a high risk or, um, you know, where the, the COVID virus is more manifested. Mm. Um, but a lot of negotiations, a lot of back and forth, a lot of fighting. Yes. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we, we, we definitely managed to get to a point where, you know, we, we sort of understood each other and we understood that, you know, we can operate safely, you know, within the framework. Of course, it didn't help that international you know, source markets, some of those, you know, were closed uh, in terms of allowing, you know, their citizens to traveling. That didn't help. Uh, it, it sort of makes our, you know, recovery prolonged. Uh, but domestically, we're able to show that South Africans can get out and travel and they can support the industry within the framework that we've created. But it was a lot of discussion that went, you know, into that, a lot of back and forth and from the international inbound, even more. Uh, because as you know, we, we, we started to have these variants that were yes. found, you know, yeah. in South Africa, um, uh, you know, the, the, the B variant, the Omicron and others, you know, and the world just shut down and say, you oh, know, we're not sending our people to South Africa. So that didn't help. And mm. it took a lot of negotiations from various stakeholders to make sure that, you know, we convinced some of our key markets to allow their citizens to travel to South Africa. So a lot of work with government. Government didn't understand uh, the virus. They were still learning as well. They didn't understand how to control it. They were still learning. Uh, and, you know, it took a lot of back and forth until we find each other. You know, we wanted the business to open. Government wanted to protect uh, the citizens from the virus and make sure that there's a minimal impact. Um, you know, we shared the same vision of minimal impact. Uh, however, we were also saying that, you know, we're going to have a situation with jobs and people not being able to earn. And, and that's why, you know, the introduction of UAR, UIF TS program mm. was critical. Mm. And we conceptualize it from the government side of, side of um, like from the private sector side of things. So say, there is money at UIF. How do we tap into that fund to make sure that some of the people that are impacted are able to earn a little bit of money to sustain themselves? And again, a lot of discussion and negotiations. The system was not 
um, uh, it, it was not user friendly at all, but we had to do what we had to do to make yeah. sure that we get as many people as possible uh, to get the UIFTS money. How involved did the TBCSA get in disputes within the industry? You know, uh, you know, from a from a DMC point of view, it wasn't you know when enforcing cancellation policies and things like that. It 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 wasn't the the DMC cancelling. It it was the hotel cancelling because the hotel was shut down. So, um, but then the hotels and lodges were trying to enforce cancellation policies and cancellation charges, um, when in fact it was it was them who were forced to cancel the booking. So, in terms of all the internal uh, disputes that were happening, business interruption insurance and all that, where where did those businesses turn? Was it SATSA? Was it TBCSA? Uh, Fed, how, how does so from from somebody who's listening now, if it happens again, where where do they direct their initial sort of grievance or complaint? Yeah. Look, the, the initial grievance or complaints went to the associations, uh, the likes of Satsa, Sata, Fed Hasa, uh, Savrala, and the list goes on and on. Mm. The associations that are involved or were involved, um, you know, we, we took up, you know, the fight when the associations came to us and said, look, uh, their members are saying that there is a difficulty in, you know, business interruption insurance. We then took up that fight and said, okay, you know, who do we need to talk to? Who do we need to unlock? Uh, and, and there were lots of uh, discussion that happened. And we were able to get some few, um, you know, I mean, that, that was a bigger battle for us to get to a point where there could be some payment that was made to businesses. Yes. And yes. I think the battle still continues even today because I see mm. some of the cases are being, you know, resolved now. Uh, in terms of the... Um, uh, refunds uh, or cancellations. Uh, I mean, we had to get involved because, you know, it's a dispute uh, between, like you said, the DMC or the retail travel agent, the hotel being closed, the imposition of the cancellation fees. And the way we approach it is to say that, you know, we are all in this together. No one is benefiting from this. It's not because, you know, someone wanted to cancel willingly. It's because of yes. the circumstances that we're in. And we encourage that, uh, you know, we need to, to, to work in a way that we should not impose cancellation fees and we should be able to return the money to the traveler because this is something that none of us anticipated. So, mm -hmm. so that was the spirit of saying, let's work together. I remember even issuing a communication uh, from our side as TBCSA to say, let's work together. Let's make sure that, uh, you know, those that are canceling get their money back, whether they're international travelers, our domestic travelers, let's make sure that we do it right because we also need those travelers to come back to South Africa when everything is settled down. Uh, and mm. I think that, you know, as tough it, as it was, uh, we handled it very well as an industry uh, to the point that now we're starting to see, I mean, we are seeing a lot more robust numbers coming into South Africa. So th there is that element. And I think we should continue, you know, on that. Should we have any crisis? We should be able to solve it uh, from from within, and being able to work together, um, you know, in a harmonious way, to ensure mm. that uh, you know we solve the issues that we have amongst ourselves. So we did get involved. Uh, we mm. did get involved in, especially the business interruption insurance. Um, when it comes to uh, you know the restaurants and and everybody else, and also the issues of you know force majeure. Uh, I remember there yes. was a. A time when you know we had a, a lot of discussion around that uh, to say that uh, you know how do we make sure that you know if you're a large hotel group you have suppliers that you pay on a uh, on a monthly basis that that are retained and if you go and say the industry is open and but it's not fully open you know they needed to resume paying those suppliers but there was no money coming in so we needed to also consider that aspect to say. You know, how do we make sure that we do things responsibly uh, and yeah. we don't, you know, our, our you know, uh, uh, members uh, in, a, in a position where we say we're all open, but there's no one who's coming in. There's yes. no international travelers coming in. Domestic travel is not happening because they will then have to resume paying, uh, you know, those suppliers. So we had to consider many things and we had mm. to make responsible uh, decisions. Yeah. I know in the UK there you know, everyone's kind of looking back now and there's um, committees and task teams and all that kind of 
kind of uh, looking back as to the decisions being made and evaluating whether there was overreactions and how that impacted people's livelihoods and businesses. It, it, what, I mean, in, in South Africa, we is anybody kind of lo looking back now and uh, or has everybody just kind of moved on and, and not, not wanting to even think about it anymore? Um, just in terms of holding the people to account who made the decisions that potentially were an overreaction. I mean, did we have to shut down domestically and have hotels completely wiped and empty? And uh, is, is anything going on or is everybody just happy kind of just to put it behind them now? I think, you know, because we're still recovering, you know, everyone is still fo is focusing on, you know, how do we regain the momentum that we lost? Yeah. Um, but I agree with you that, you know, we need to, to set up some time to reflect, you know, on, 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 on how we did as a tourism industry. I think one piece of it we did, uh, in terms of, you know, starting to look at the crisis, um, you know, how to handle crisis, you know, as a tourism, you know, uh, 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 you know, individual, you know, uh, or collective, um, because we, we we need to this type of situation may happen differently going forward. Mm. And how do we make sure that we, we we handle crisis you know better, and we respond to crisis better, uh, and also put mechanisms in place to make sure that uh, you know when there's a crisis, you know we are able to know what are the few steps that we need to take uh, to deal with the crisis. So there is a crisis strategy that uh, you know has been developed um, you know for South Africa and I know even for the region. Uh, you know, there has been some work done, you know, to, to ensure that, uh, the crisis, you know, strategy and response, you know, it's, it's embedded in, in what we do. Also from the business point of view, you know, the resilience, uh, especially from the SMME, you know, point of view, uh, you know, post COVID, we did, um, business resilience, uh, with the uh, international labor organization. Uh, to to say you know teach the SMMEs you know how do you navigate you know crisis you know that we just came out of because small businesses were the ones that were decimated now uh, mostly big businesses suffered and they borrowed lots of money uh, to stay afloat and some of these businesses are still paying you know that money back some you know in medium sized businesses may not be able to pay back mm. uh, so. I think the resilience part, you know, is quite important. But this was unprecedented, uh, and nobody has ever seen it. Uh, you know, we we've heard of it, we read about it in mm. history books. Uh, but you know, to to have happened and the way it happened, I think for now, you know, we're sort of focusing on recovery and mm. making sure that we regain the momentum, as I've said. But we need to sit down and reflect, and reflect on the types of decision that we made and what influenced those decisions? Was it the fact that we knew little uh, or we didn't listen enough to the experts or we ignored the experts and we're saying, no, 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 we're just going to, you know, do things a certain way. Uh, and yeah. also how do you interact with government? Uh, yeah. We would full. Um, could we have done more um, under the circumstances and also in hindsight? Uh, so we, we we still need to do that reflection and 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 looking back. Yes, and to, uh, how influential is the the TBCSA in in affecting the government's decisions when it comes to how how you know are there, you know there's always been this long term kind of dichotomy if that's the right word between the Home Affairs and the Tourism uh, you know the South African Tourism Board. Um, or the Department of Tourism, I should say. So, in terms of you know, when the home, the unabridged birth certificates, the e visas that that doesn't seem to be working properly, you know, who who actually champions the? Uh, yes, uh, of course, it is the the TBCSA. But when when it comes to like actual numbers and, and showing things that that are not working in terms of of um, driving tourism numbers up and job creation and all that, where where does where does the kind of buck stop, as it were, in terms of because obviously the Home Affairs has a, a duty of care to protect the borders, but then that could affect tourism, and you know how do you, how do you navigate through all of that? Well, that, that's always a challenge uh, because we, you know, we work with government that has 
the mandate, you know, that may be different from a mandate. Yes. You know, our mandate is to get as many South Africans as possible to travel uh, and to get as many international travelers to come into South Africa uh, and tour the country. And by doing so, we'll be able to create jobs and impact the economy. Now, when you look at the issues of visas, as an example, um, you know, this is where, you know, you start to learn a whole lot more what, you know, influence the decisions of government when it comes to issuing visa waivers or speeding up issuing a visa or having more resources to ensure that the systems that we have are robust enough. Mm. And this goes back to how government views tourism. We do know in South Africa that we have a Department of Tourism, which is a great step to show that, you know, we're recognizing tourism uh, and we establish what we call the tourism satellite account, uh, where we can be able to look at the impact, you know, of tourism to the economy, how many people work in the tourism space, how it impacts the value chain across the board. However, the many decisions that impact or many things that impact tourism are not sitting in tourism. It's just around visas, visa waivers, and e-visa seats at Home Affairs. So how we work with Home Affairs is key. Equally so, even within Home Affairs, Home Affairs will tell you that we don't make decisions on which country should get visa waiver or not. You know, there is the security cluster that needs to get involved. And security clusters is within government. You know, there's the state security and others that are involved in security. They do the threats analysis and they're able to say this country is good. Or if we're going to have a visa waiver with country A, we need them to, to do one, two, three, four for us to be able to do visa waiver. Mm. Uh, as an example, if you look at the SADC region, the only country that requires visa to South Africa, I think, is DRC, uh, Democratic mm -hmm. Republic of Congo. And I've asked, what is the reason? And mm. it was an issue around the population register. You know, the oh, okay. population register is probably, you know, not necessarily reliable or it needs more improvement for them to be able to, to, to get the status. So there are many things that goes into it when we start to talk about that. What Equally, if the, the fact that there are many things that goes into it, that makes it complicated. There are things that need to be done that doesn't require any complications or that doesn't bring out challenges. For example, if we put an e-visa, make sure that it works. Make sure <laughs> that people who can adjudicate and conclude, you know, those visa applications. It's no point in concluding things late because people decide, as you've said, they've got a choice of where they want to go. It's no point in adjudicating late and making a decision late. So we have to, to be fast, we have to be first, and we have to make sure that, you know, we give those visas fast so that they can say, yay, I'm coming to South Africa. So mm. there is that. Um, you know, interesting enough, I was talking to the guys at SAA uh, coming out of West Africa as an example. So we, we say to people that you need to book your ticket uh, and then you're going to apply for visa. You book your yeah. ticket, you book your accommodation, you're going to apply for visa. They, they go and do that and they apply for visa. Then they don't get their visa. Then they cancel their ticket and accommodation. So if you're an airline like SAA, you already reserved that seat. But last minute, because the visa can't be issued, you can't resell that seat. You yeah. have to do your So mm. it, it doesn't work down the road because... You know, they have to offload so many people, but they cannot replace them because, you you know, the, the cycle of, you know, the situation is the same. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. it's important that, you know, if we are saying that we're going an e-visa route, let's make sure that everything is fast and it reflects the fact that e-visa, it's a technology type of solution. Mm. And therefore, if it's a technology type of a solution, let's make sure that you get the response fast enough uh, to be able to make decisions, you know, for travel. So you do have those type of, of, of limitations, but I think e-visa, the response time and things like that, those are the things that we have a control over. We need to be able to go back to people on time. But then on top of that, you're going to hear that, oh, well, there's no money, you know, in the fiscals. And therefore we can't hire enough people or we don't have money to hire enough people to do the adjudication, you know, when people apply for visa. So, you have all these challenges that are there mm. uh, that you have to navigate. Uh, and our job is it's to constantly be on the, on the forefront 
Uh, because if we can't give up on these things, we can't go and say, no, we're not going to do anything. Then oh. nothing, we have to keep yeah. on it. We have to be patient. We have to be persistent. And we have to make sure that ultimately at the end we win. And we did so with an abrid based certificate. Yes. For years and goodness, yeah, yeah. We're talking about it. Uh, it took, you know, some, some work that we had to do, some pushing, uh, industry leaders pushing. And finally, uh, you know, talking to the president and being able to get that, you know, go through, you know, various channels and get it scrapped for, for international, you know, families traveling with the children. So it's, it's, it's challenging because as business, we want things to, we, we move fast. Yeah. You know, it's something that needs to be fixed. It, it's fixed now. I always give an example. Um, if you work in a hotel space and there's a best pipe, you don't go and say, we need five quotations and come and present. Yeah. And you go and yeah. get the, the person who can fix the pipe to fix it, get things moving, and you can deal with the consequences later. You don't mm -hmm. wait and say, while the water is, you know, moving everywhere, we need five quotations. Yeah. And we need to write RFP. No, you do things and fix what you need to fix now and get going with it. So yeah. those are the type of things that, you know, we differ with, uh, with government. Um, but again, government is us and we need to be able to influence how fast things should go and we need to find each other. Yeah. In terms of uh, local domestic tourism, how I've certainly seen a big shift because static rates and all that kind of stuff just weren't, um, weren't as prim pre uh, prevalent as, as they are now. I've had discussions with with um, international uh, agents and operators who uh, are not happy about seeing static rates, saying sort of why why should locals get it cheaper than internationals? I my opinion on that differs very very strongly because of course you know simple fact of exchange rate and buying power of the pound dollar euro um, versus versus the rand. Um, again, it's also a private enterprise, so a business can charge whatever they want for their room. So if they choose to charge 50,000 rand a night for internationals or 10,000 rand a night, if you've got a South African passport, then, then, you know, that's, that's up to, up to the business. I think that the South African, local South Africans certainly gave and propped up a lot of businesses during, um, during COVID. Um, do you do you think it's a good practice to have kind of rates set aside that locals can afford? You know, for the luxury lodges, or or are you happy that there are enough spaces for locals at at sort of one one thousand, two thousand rand a night that is affordable? So, you know, that you know topic came up, especially during COVID, um, where. And I would say that the market sort of self-corrected uh, in a way uh, that it started to look at it and say, well, these are the people that can travel now. So in order to keep the doors open, you know, we need to get, you know, the locals to travel at uh, the most affordable rates, mm. um, you know, and, and, and it adjusted. And those rates, you know, some of them have stayed the same uh, since COVID. Uh, because others have realized that, you know, with domestic market, they can still, you know, push the envelope. Mm. But what we need to look at uh, for, from, from how I look at this is that everyone has, a, has an experience that they're offering. Uh, a high-end lodge has an experience that's, that it is offering. And sometimes when you offer that experience, you need more headcount, mm. you know, per person uh, or per traveler to offer that experience that you, 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 you promise. So if you say that you're going to uh, a Lodge A or Lodge B, uh, which is known to do certain things, it takes a certain amount of people to deliver those type of services. And therefore, it influences the price of that particular you know, lodge. That's why if you go to uh, you know, a three-star lodge versus a five-star lodge, there will always be a difference in terms of the service delivery. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so forth and so on. So I think we need to look at it from that point of view to say from service delivery point of view, you know, how do we, how many people are needed and therefore what influences the price of that particular place? In terms of whether we should have a two-tier pricing or three-tier pricing, I mean, Sun Parks does have a, a price for South African, price for SADAC region and price for international. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, the jury is still out. Uh, as yeah. you said, you have a different view uh, about it. Others have a different view. Um, I think that we need to, to, to sit down and talk about it and say, what are the advantages and disadvantages of doing either one of those? Mm. You know, what are we going to be faced with? Uh, and also, are we fixing something that's broken? If the issue only sits at a five-star market, for example, then let's have a conversation about the five-star market. Uh, yeah. And to say that, you know, is the five-star market in South Africa, you know, is it sub can it be supported by domestic tourism? And to what extent is it supported by domestic tourism? Uh, and then we can look at it and say, okay, if it's mostly international, is is this sustainable? Um, yep. You know, and, and, and having that discussion will, will open up, you know, maybe some few ideas in terms of do we go and then have a two-tier pricing? And also, what is it going to look like from service delivery point of view? Are you getting, are you, is the local going to get a bit less of a service? Yeah. Or is it the same service? Uh, but, you know, the, 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 the investors are not getting, are not going to get the same amount of money. We need to discuss that. But what I think is important, what's important is what I said in the beginning is what type of service do we want to offer or the standard of service that we want to offer? How many personnel does it take uh, to offer that service? Because as it is, you know, today, not all five-star hotels charges the same price. Mm. Not all five-star lodges charges the same price. What is the difference? The difference is most likely sits on the delivery model. You know, someone can say, um, I'm the best in the world. And per one traveler, I hire five people. Mm. And one can say, yeah, I'm in the medium, whatever, but for one traveler, I'll hire two people. So obviously the operational costs are going to be different. Uh, because of, of those permutations. So I think that it, it, it stems from there. I always believe that we, we, we operate in a, in a market environment um, and supply and demand, you know, it really does a very good job <laughs> of creating prices. Yeah. Uh, and so this during COVID. Yes. All right. So Chief, I uh, always like to end off on a, on a positive note, if I can, <laughs> how, what, what's exciting you about, um, the future in, in tourism in South Africa? What, uh, what's come across your desk? What's, um, you know, what, what are you looking forward to in the next year or so? That's really going to, really going to make a lot of people happy in the tourism industry. Well, I think that we're going to recover fully this year. Uh, I think the numbers that, uh, we are seeing being reported by hotel groups and, uh, many lodges and many, you know, operators are showing some positive, uh, uh, you know, uh, positivity in the future ahead. Uh, I think we are in for good tourism season going forward. Uh, and we should see more and more people traveling into South Africa. Uh, we need to unlock China and India. Yes, absolutely. I believe that if, when we have unlocked those two markets, we will get as many tourists as possible. And we're going to start to see more investments, you know, in, in, in the tourism space uh, by way of new hotels coming uh, or being built in various areas. Uh, we'll start to see more lodges uh, being built or being renovated, start to see more buses on the road, more, mm. you know, new aircrafts, you know, coming through to South Africa and also, you know, in and around South Africa. So I think that we're going to see more and more people traveling. Um, interest rates are going to go down um, yes. at some point. Um, things are going to start to become a bit more affordable uh, across the board. And more and more South Africans are going to travel. More and more international travelers are coming into South Africa. What we need to do is just to keep on it. Mm. Let's keep marketing. You know, let's keep a steady hand. Uh, and we should never give up. Uh, the good days are ahead. And yes. you know, we all want to prosper, uh, you know, together as we reap, you know, the rewards of what we've sown over the past few years. Yeah. Well, that's great, uh, Chief. Thanks so much for your your time. It's always good to get uh, the opinion of somebody who's as close to to government and decision makers as you are. So thanks very much. And um, I'll I'll let you know when this goes out. And yeah, just just thanks for being a champion of of all good things in the uh, in the tourism world. And I look forward to seeing you um, 
again soon, hopefully somewhere somewhere in Southern Africa or, or internationally. Thank you so much, Graham. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Chief. Ciao. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to KuzaCast, where we explore the world of tourism with leaders from all corners of the globe. Join me, Graham Watson, for future episodes as we dive into the latest trends and insights from the industry. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a rating, and we'll see you next time on KuzaCast.